So uh, the talk is about resuming pods after support instance shut down with the cheeky title of the party must go on. Um, so who am I? I'm Wafak, I'm an engineer at QA Wolf and Emeritus Maintainer at Crossplane, which is a CNCF project. And I've been involved in CNCF community since about like 2019. Um, so I work at QA Wolf. What, what is QA Wolf? QA Wolf has a platform that runs all these QA tests, browser tests, and a group of engineers, in-house QA engineers, that writes and maintains those tests. Together, we make up the QA Wolf team, where we, we can provide you high coverage with zero effort. Effectively, a company comes to QA Wolf, hey, we want our web apps to be tested, and we write the tests, we maintain them, we schedule them, uh, we just tell you about the bugs. Uh, and it's the high velocity, and that gives you like you know confidence to, to ship much more frequently. So this is an example um, playground. Uh, on the left, you see that we use like playwright tests, usual browser tests, code, and on the right, you're, you're seeing blogs and the, and the browser page. Um, so in order to do that at our scale, we are running over two million test runs every month. Uh, that means hundreds of nodes. Um, so in order, to, in order for this to be affordable, we're using spot instances in Google Cloud, which gives you like you know about 40 to 60 percent cost reduction. Um, but the main thing with spot instances is that they fail randomly. They just restart, and like you know, uh, Google like GCP tells you like pick up and go in 30 seconds effectively. So because of that, up to five percent of our runs uh, fail because of these uh, shutdowns, um, and. 5% is a, a noticeable, especially because it doesn't use customers, so almost every customer gets the 5%, and especially the long-running jobs are more exposed uh, to these failures. So there are like, you know, there were a couple options about how to overcome this. One is, well, do not use spot instances, which was not a fully an option, but which is something we partly did by retrying on standard nodes. So if a test fails for the first time, uh, then in the second try, we are scheduling it to a standard node so that that customer uh, sees less symptoms of, uh, of that failure. And the second option was, uh, well, let's run the test in VMs using like Firecracker, for example, so that we are still in Kubernetes, but use a micro VM which has snapshot and like you know, restore capabilities. <laughs> However, that required nested virtualization to be enabled or the cluster nodes to be bare metals, and neither of them are available in GKE, and QA Evolve is fully on GCP using GKE clusters. Um, and in addition, like, that would introduce some friction with using the Kata containers, so like, you, know, you would get away from like, standard upstream Kubernetes stuff, which, which may uh, increase the bug surface. So the third option was using a tool called Checkpoint Restoring User Space, CRIU, to migrate the process tree. Not the whole VM, but the process tree that we care about. Um, and CRIU is, is, is not like a new project. It, it's, it's mature, and like, you know, I think it's over like, you know, 10 years, and it's got like, a lot of Linux kernel changes in to make it work. Um, so with CRIU, there's also some effort already going on in Kubernetes, upstream Kubernetes that is focused on forensic analysis. You, if you look up, you, you're going to see like there's some blog posts where you can use a kubelet alpha API to take a checkpoint of a container and then inspect it for like you know forensic analysis. Um, but it doesn't support restore yet. Um, so one option was that, which is what we went for initially. Uh, and the second is in-container execution of CRIU when the node shutdown is received. And that, that doesn't use any of the like, Kubelet API, it just does everything inside a container, which requires elevator privileges. Um, so to explain that, let's, let's look into how CRIU works. Um, yeah, in a minute. <laughs> so the first option that we went with CRIU support in upstream Kubernetes, um, 
So we started on that path, and right now the support is uh, run C at low slate on the right. You, you can see what, what it takes to start a container in Kubernetes. Run C can take a checkpoint and restore today using Cryo. Um, and container D and Cryo also can call that RPC of Run C to take that checkpoint and restore as well. And Kubelet, in, even if in alpha, supports taking that checkpoint, but it doesn't have an endpoint to restore it yet. So the main reason that this has, had become blocker for us was that container D did not have the support for Kubelet API wiring up. Uh, and GK uses ContainerD. Um, we start, uh, we looked into like setting up a cryo cluster separately, uh, but that just like, you know, meant a lot of like effort to maintain that on scale with two million plus uh, test runs. However, supporting ContainerD was merged two weeks ago. Of course, it's gonna take time like to be released in ContainerD and then uh, be part of uh, GKE. But yeah, that's kind of like, you know, uh, one layer uh, handled as well. And the next uh, thing was the storage medium support. So when you take a for checkpoint for forensic analysis, it writes that to the host path of the node, which also doesn't work for us because we are losing the node, right? Where we want another node, so we have to like, you know, copy manually. Uh, ideally, we would like it to be like, you know, to be written to persistent volume or a bucket mounted as volume. Um, an API server doesn't know anything about checkpoint or store. So there's some like, you know, progress here uh, being made, but it did not like, you know, work for us uh, without like, you know, heavy lifting of like, you know, and diverging away from GKE. And you can follow the progress with uh, in CAP 2008. So we went with effectively, it started as POC and then like, you know, turned into a real thing. The second option, in container execution, uh, which requires elevated privileges. So in order to understand how this works or why it needs elevated privileges, we need to understand how Creo works. So what Creo does, it first infects the process. It effectively uses ptrace and freezes the process. This is very similar to in IDEs where you put a break, that breakpoint and it stops the process. Uh, so it does that by using ptrace and because it needs to inject parasite code, that, that's why it requires like more capabilities, like close to root capabilities to do that. And then that parasite code dumps uh, all the memory, file descriptor, open connections, a lot of things uh, surrounding the process. Not everything, but a lot, quite a few things that, that are required to restore the process. And that may include sensitive data as well. For example, if you have a secret mounted in your process, reading it, that is going to be included in the memory. So it's, uh, it's quite a uh, sensitive data. And then in restore, uh, by the way, this is like at a very high level. There are lots of details that I'm skipping over, but just to give you an idea of like, you know, what it's doing. Um, and during restore, it prepares, uh, it loads like, you know, all these files and prepares, prepares the environment and it creates namespaces, which we will get to. Um, to be able to recover the same processes with the same PIDs, and then it creates the processes uh, one by one, the tree, and maps them to those memory, and then uh, takes itself out from the from the process. So it's like quite a heavy lifting that it does, um, and it required like you know some of like Linux kernel changes, which are all in in Linux six. Uh, at least that's what we were using. But that's kind of like, you know, the general idea of how Cree works. Um, so this is like, you know, another, a, a, a more complex example. We, should be, we saw like, you know, what happens in a single process, and that's a process study, which is usually the case with like, you know, most of the workloads. Um, so the thing with Cree is that it takes care of a lot of things, but there needs to be a, point where it stops like, you know, doing things for you because they become so like, you know, process specific. For example, PID 10 here, it has a log file open, right? Um, so when you take checkpoint of this tree and you restore it and that log file doesn't exist, it fails because it has an open file descriptor. 
uh, and it's the process, because it's frozen exactly at the same place, it doesn't know whether a file existed or it doesn't have the knowledge to recreate it unless it has like specific logic inside of it. But at the same time, Creo doesn't take copy of that log file because it just doesn't know about it. Or even if it did, it could be like, you know, made available by the user. It could be like 10 gig of file that are that is part of the like volume that are already in, that is already in place. So it just like you know doesn't know whether it's a generated file, it's a file that are like system file, for example, a library file that is open by the process. Because it's such a low level, it just doesn't have those uh, details. So when you restore a process, you need to make sure these surrounding uh, resources are in place. Like for example, log file, you have to copy that um, or create another empty file so that it continues from there. And for example, in the second one, use CPID 12 is a graphical user interface that uh, talks to X11, which is a socket, Linux socket, that it sends the graphic. So with sockets, for example, every socket has like two end and both ends must be in place for restoration to work. Because like, you know, remember the process doesn't know that we're taking the checkpoint. So it expects exactly the same, exactly the same state. So, and also the open TCP connection. So to make this all like, you know, more concrete, let's, let's do a, like a simple, small demo of Creo uh, in a Linux environment. And it's completely Linux, so like, you can't really do it in, in, in macOS at all. So this is a uh, Linux VM that I have here. So, so here in this like, first demo, we have a counter. It just counts like one by one, and then prints a PID as well. The checkpoint folder is empty. Um, so let's start this process. Okay, so every second it prints like you know, one, two, three, four. It has a PID of 51399. So I'm going to another tab. I am going to dump this process. I need to know its PID. I need to give this a dash J, which I will get to in a second, and then the directory to save all those image files. Well, it, it needs sudo permissions. <coughs> uh, root permissions. Okay. It's done. So count is at 35 and it kills the process. There's an option to leave it running, but by default, after uh, dumping, it, it kills it. So if we look at here, checkpoint folder is populated with all these files about the process. Uh, Creo also comes with a tool called Crick that lets you inspect uh, <coughs> the checkpoint. For example, um, let's actually clear x.ps. So these are the processes included in the checkpoint. And let's look at, for example, file descriptors that are open. As you can see, there is the 0, 1, 2, which are std in, std out, and std r. They're all bound to TTY. So this is the um, checkpoint that we have on disk. So we are going to restore it. When, when restoring, we, I don't need to give the PID because it's in the checkpoint. Restore. I also need to give the J. Well, yeah. So it continues from the exact same spot where it left here. We left it at 35, and here we're continuing from 36. So this is like, you know, very simple loop of like, you know, how Creo works and what it provides you, which is quite nice. Um, so, but we're not like, you know, that was an example in a Linux VM uh, in a terminal, but we're not running our uh, jobs in a terminal. It needs to be inside a container, and that was the option that we went with. So our first goal is going to be <coughs> running Creo in container, and we're just going to go over like you know the problems that we faced when we tried to do that. So the first problem is the PID collusion problem. 
when you start a process in a container, it takes up the PID one, right? Um, and it may spawn like PID two and other processes. And when you trigger a CRU dump, it takes the checkpoint of this process tree and PID has to stay the same. So when you restore, CRU would start with PID, has to start with PID one, so PID one is taken. So it's not able to restore that. In fact, CRU rejects taking PID one uh, process, uh, dump of PID ones, uh, as far as I remember, if, if you don't override it. So there's this problem which you can overcome by, for example, spinning up some processes, empty processes, so that the first process takes a like PID five, and then when you restore, it's available. Which is like you know somewhat what we're going to do. Um, so the next problem is that this is um, somewhat of a lesser known fact is that so you saw we had the file descriptors open for STD in out and error. They were all they were all bound to TTY. That's what happens like when you run a process in, in a terminal. But when you run it in a container using run C, it actually binds them to STD into dev null and STD out and error to pipes. This pipe is effectively the vertical line that we use in terminal, very similar to that. But every pipe has a unique ID when it's assigned. So you take the checkpoint, process says, okay, I'm writing like STD out and STD out to 287 and 458. But when you restore, those pipes either need to be in place, which like you no know, IDs are randomly assigned, and there needs to be like other end of the pair that listens to that ID. But when you start another container, it starts with another pipe ID that is assigned by its own on its own. This is like you know I'm glossing over some of the like you know of the details here, but these are like you know the two like you know initially blocking problems. For example, in this case, uh, if you restore a process that doesn't write anything to std out or std error, then that's fine. It, it, it's, it runs well. So to orchestrate that and like you know to to like bump the PID and like you know make sure the pipes are in place, we we wrote an open source command wrapper that orchestrates running CRIO. It effectively like prevents the environment for um, taking the checkpoint and also during restore. It 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 gives us room to like you know uh, do all these preparations uh, to make sure it works inside a container. For example, the PID collusion problem, what it does is quick start as PID one, and it pushes the PID contour to a very high number so that the process it starts, starts with like in a very high PID. Uh, there are like, you know, other ways to do this, uh, but like, you know, this has, this has been like, you know, uh, working for the use cases so far. Um, but what, ha what happens is that the process that you give it starts with 9001, and you start CRIU, this PID is not really relevant, and then when this stores, CRIC scans the checkpoint folder, and if it sees a <coughs> checkpoint image, it starts CRIU. And then when CRIU restores, obviously those like, you know, high numbers are available. There might be some other processes along with CRIC uh, that are run because CRIC doesn't require you to start with PID one, so that's like, you know, you need to have the room in between. For example, you can start like other logging processes or other stuff, uh, but you shouldn't start like you know, 9,000 processes or you shouldn't start them after Craig. Uh, so that the PIDs of the restores uh, process are not taken. And the TTY in con container, so we said like these pipes have an ID and like you know, the other end must be listening. Um, what CRIC does is that when it takes the checkpoint, and this is the same mechanism that run C does for its support, upstream support, uh, for restoring processes, it takes note of those pipes in, in a separate file in the checkpoint directory. Um, so that like, it knows that when it restores 287 and 458 should be bound to FD1 and 2 of CRIO. So Creo has this uh, inherit FD option, inherit FD flag that you give a file, open file descriptor to Creo, 
and Creo can tell the process, hey, this file you have open, you should write to this one. So process still thinks that it writes to that file, but it ends up in, this, in those file, open file descriptors. So Creek orchestrates that like, you know, by taking note of this pipe number and then like you know, during restore, it tells Creo to make it inherit those uh, FDs instead of the pipes. And then it just forwards the STD out the STDR to, to run C. So it all happens in the container. Cool. So these are these were like you know two like initial blockers to get it running on a container. The, the simple uh, counter. So let's let's see that in action. Um, well. So uh, we're building a Docker file. Creo needs to be available. Installing Creek and copying the Creek config, which is which has just like an you know, image directory slash checkpoint. And then we're running the counter uh, by giving it like an you know, arguments, uh, by giving it as argument to Creek run. So I built this image because I. I'm afraid of the Wi-Fi here, so uh, we are going to run this. So this privilege flag is, is needed to write to NS last PID, and we're mounting the checkpoint folder. Um, so let's see, Docker logs. Um, well, actually, we're in the wrong uh, directory. Okay. Okay, empty checkpoint. So Docker run this pod, Docker logs zero A. Okay, so it started the command with PID 1001. It, it counts similarly, and then it also set up a seek term handler to take the checkpoint so that you don't have to exec and like, you know, take the checkpoint. This is the same mechanism we use in the Kubernetes pod that we're, we're going to see that Kubernetes sends the seek term signal and you have like 15, 15 seconds to shut down. So what we are going to do is effectively stop it, just like we would expect from, from Kubernetes. Docker stop, 0A1. And receive the seek term checkpoint taken in 47 milliseconds. So if you look at checkpoint folder now, we see this fun configuration YAML. Uh, well, yeah, we need to own that. Because it was taken from by root in the container. Okay, so you see this, like, you know, we have the Unix file, the scripted trio. First one is devnull, stdn, and the pipe numbers. Um, similarly, if we go to checkpoint, create x fds, you see these are the pipes uh, that are set by, by run c, and we are going to override them with, uh, with file descriptors of, of Creo. So <clears throat> the checkpoint is in place. So we're going to run the same um, Docker run command that we did. And Creek is going to see that this directory has some checkpoint files, so we don't have to run Creo restore. It's going to run it for us. And once it sees that, it, it will try to restore it. Oh, we were in the wrong uh, directory. Okay, it, it mounted the wrong directory, so we're, we need to run it here so that the PWD is, is correct. PWD here. Okay, it found the checkpoint and it continues from exactly the same count uh, that it left earlier. 
Cool. So we, we were, we're like, you know, moving one by one up the layer. First we did it in the terminal and now we did it in the container. And the, the, the third one is like, you know, we were running in Kubernetes and we're running much more complex processes, QA tests that includes like browser and the whole thing. So when you look at the screen, in order to make this work, there's a pod running that includes a VNC server WebSocketify that converts that TCP traffic to WebSocket, Node.js, Playwright, and the browser. So it's quite the complex process tree, and there's lots of like external resources that need to be handled. So some of the problems that we ran into and we're going to uh, we're going we will be going over is like you know runtime files into resources, and then like you know we're going to get to a point where we do the demo that it restores all of the all of those processes. So the first one is runtime files. So as we said, the restored process doesn't have the knowledge that it's being restored. So it expects the files to be in place that it had open. And with Docker images, we're bringing the, all the files uh, as part of the image, but there are also runtime files that are generated during like, you know, execution of the process. For example, WebKit browser that we're going to see uh, creates root cache folder uh, in the runtime, and because it doesn't know it, it's being restored, it effectively expects them, and uh, when it doesn't see them, it fails. So what Creek does is to copy those files to extra files. So this is the one of the problems that actually wouldn't happen in the ongoing upstream efforts, because Run C knows about those files. Because when you start a container, it there's like image layers, and on top you have the writable layer that Runcy is aware of. So it can just take copy of the whole writable layer and zip it. But in our case, we don't know because we're running in the container. We don't even know it. it's, it's an overlay FS. So we just have, like, the user has to let us know or we have to inspect the checkpoint for the paths. But right now, what we have is, like, you know, user actually tells us which paths that we want to be available uh, when we restore. And there are like you know, some entry resources uh, like sockets um, that this is uh, like a small uh, annoyance that we like you have to make sure that all the folders uh, till that socket is available, which also Creek like you know uh, takes care of. But this is also another one that you like that you try to restore your process, see the error, and like you add these app specific uh, workarounds as configurations. And the third one in the list was C group v2 files. So in C group v2, in Kubernetes, at least in, in GKE, uh, so some processes want to know like current memory usage and high, like what's the max so that they can optimize like, web, like browsers. And that has dynamic path of like, and that includes pod UID, container ID, which is going to change because we're starting another container. So what Crick does is that it effectively scans, inspects the, the checkpoint, scans for this path, calculates the new path, and then tell it to override those paths, inherit the open file descriptor effectively, uh, so that it thinks that it's, right, it's still writing the same file, but it actually ends up in the, wrong, in the, in the right path. And the last one is, um, this is kind of a, like a funny one. So, there's an event type called inotify in Linux that processes can set up for a file so that they can get event. When that file changes, like time zone, for example, for this specific browser, um, but overlayfs doesn't actually support it out of the band. So when you run these processes in container, you never get an event. Um, but Creo, when it restores it, 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 it's, it tries to make sure that those identify handles are in place and that fails because overlayfs doesn't support them, at least by default, unless you configure them. So this is effectively like a small hack that we had to put in place that we effectively delete that identify before taking the checkpoint. Uh, so that like, you know, of course that requires the application to be able to handle this. So there are like, you know, a couple of other ones. One was like a small bug in Creo, which is, uh, resolved in that PR. Um, and the last one, which we, uh, we didn't really solve, but just uh, worked around, is that port IPs change. 
So, you, so Creo is able to lock the network connection and continue from where it was before without even dropping the connection. But that requires port IP, uh, uh, the both ends of the TCP connection to have the same IP when you restore as well, which is not possible with pods because when you create a new pod, it assigns a new pod IP. So our app had to be able to like, you know, handle the retries and reconnects when, when the connection drops. Cool, so let's see all that in action and like, you know, with a real uh, pod playground. Um, so this is an example test in our platform. Um, so at the same time, let's Okay, so we keep CTL, get pause. So this is our playground system. Um, turn it to slow, as usual. Okay. So when I click on workflow, it's going to create a new pod. Okay. Just keep CTL, logs. This is in a real GKE cluster, uh, not in a kind cluster. Um, so I don't have to switch to Ubuntu or anything. Um, so the process has started, a bunch of processes. And you see that uh, we're seeing this web page come up. So I'm going to just like and stop this execution and change the state here to visit Kubernetes website. Okay. So um, we have this uh, pod. It has a volume mounted to it as persistent volume, which which will have the checkpoint uh, dump to it. So what I'm going to do is I am going to delete the pod. I'm going to delete the pod and. Let's see, in the logs, we received sick term, check, taking checkpoint, and it took the checkpoint in two and a half second. Here, the connection dropped, we're waiting. So our controller creates immediately a new pod uh, with the same volume. So when Crick sees that, it's going to hopefully restore, uh, run Crick restore. So let's see, yeah. So this is like an enable for uh, debugging the Creo restore command that we, we end up using, which has like a bunch of uh, the work announced that we had. Well, the demo gods are not with us today. <laughs> Let's see. I think it's because the internet. Yeah, yeah, I, we're running out of time, but um, it actually works. <laughs> it, <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. But yeah, um, that's kind of like, you know, that's been our journey to, to get it up and running um, in, our, in our GKE setup. Um, so there's another small tool included called Node State Server, which is uh, what Creek asked, like, you know, hey, is this node shutting down? Like, you know, should I take the checkpoint or not? Uh, otherwise, we would end up like check taking checkpoint even if user aborts it. Um, and the future plan is like our general rule is we would like to converge on the upstream efforts as closely as possible. That will reduce duplicated efforts. And also, as you can see, not all of them, but some of the problems can be solved with like, you know, 
having doing all these things outside the container much better. Um, and we want to have more automation to figure out app-specific workarounds. Chrome specifically is our next target, which is the browser that we that, that are that's used most in our tests. And making Creek more configurable for other use cases as well. For example, we have some workarounds for X11. That may be some like a you know, Wayland or GNOME things that we need to do. Um, and the live migration without dropping connection. So that's actually possible with some CNIs that you can assign the same pod IP to the uh, new pod, but we're using GKE and that relies on Cilium. So we're looking for like, you know, for that Cilium feature to land to see. In that case, it would be just like, you know, that VNC we would freeze for 10 seconds and then continue from where it was before. And I would like to shout out to Creu maintainers. They were, they have been really, really helpful uh, to, to get us unblocked. They, they were they're really good, good people. Let's give them a clap for the awesome tool that they did. And yeah, that's, that's all I uh, had to say today. Uh, if you have any questions, and you can leave feedback on this QR code. But thank you for attending.